Well, today I'm sitting with Kevin Hopper, who has just completed the Orion Cup, which is standing here behind us. Kevin, what, what gave you the idea of building this beautiful cup? The idea probably started when I was a big child, uh, from plastic models, going into balsa wood models, going into radio control models, and eventually led me to a job where I was rebuilding and recovering fabric airplanes, always having a soft spot for a super cub or a J3 cub, or generally anything with fabric covering. And that led me to the first airplane that I designed called the Teddy, which was an old wooden airframe covered with fabric and it had resemblances to a super cub. And having looked at how difficult it is to manufacture, we decided it's not viable to do this as a production and I shelved it, and actually it was a very difficult thing to do, to shelve something that was so really nice and, and, and enjoyable to fly. And we ended up shelving the project until 2012. That was back in 20, uh, 2007, and in 2012 I revived it, or so I thought, when I designed the wing, which is on the Orion Cup today. And thereafter I, let, I ran out of money, which is in this game quite easy to do. And I shelved the whole project and then back in 2019 I decided now's the time to get going we have a little bit of money the idea was to build a very nice cub like aeroplane a little bit lighter and doing it with not just modern materials but to do it in the modern way which was CNC cutting all the parts router, uh, CNC routering the, 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 the likes of ribs which we've made and to cover it with Dacron the wing, having been designed in 2012, had passed all the, the criteria that we had. We had Francois Rodin do the stress analysis on it after we had done it ourselves. And that did exactly what we wanted it to do in terms of the stall speeds and the cruise speeds. And then it was just a case of, let's take a wooden airframe and turn it into a, a chrome molly tube frame. Well, that's when the learning curve started because the stresses in wood and the stresses in chrome molly tubing are so vastly different um, and it was completely new to me. I even had to go and learn how to do TIG welding so I went on a course for TIG welding. How do you cut the tubing so that all the mitres work out perfectly and the centers of the tubes come to a collective point. So doing it manually wasn't really an option. I bought the first fuselage which was basically a, a copy of the Teddy but in metal. And having looked at this and I thought, well, now let's make it wider, let's do certain things, and we shelved that yet again. So we have a fuselage that is built, but never will fly. I got hold of Aiden Canton, who came to, to me, and he's a, a, a draftsman, does CAD drawings, and was able to help me. And we originally had the thing set up so that he would do it as a part-time thing. And then in 2019, uh, December, we, we sort of spoke about, what about if you come and work for me full time? And it didn't quite happen. But when COVID started, the company he was working at sort of retrenched people because they didn't know what was going to happen. And I said, now's the time, you've got to join me. And that's what we did. So the drawing process has probably taken us almost 10 months, but there's not a single component on this airplane that we are not able to replicate uh, with a CNC machine, right from the tubing, which is cut with a rotary laser, to all the ribs, which are uh, CNC routed, and then we've developed our own press tools to manufacture the ribs and the likes of the lightning holes that we put in, the dulling of the, of the uh, aluminum ribs. Everything that we've done, we've been able to do and we've been able to replicate very simply and very quickly and very light. Dean, my son, has joined us. He uh, unfortunately also has lost his job through COVID. So I said, well, we need some hands to come and do it. In the beginning, I think there was a bit of reluctance, but I've got to tell you right now, he's absolutely enjoying it. He's done all our machine work. We've got all the aluminum uh, lathe work done. And he's climbed in and just done. It's just been a fantastic thing. It's been a learning curve for him. It's been a learning curve for Aiden. 
neither of the two of them have ever built an aeroplane before. This is a daunting project. I mean, to build something from scratch where every single part, every component has to be drawn on CAD and then made up, manufactured. I mean, every nut and bolt, every rivet, I mean, it's, it's quite daunting. What is your aim? Are you going to be selling these as kits built aircraft? The task of building a space built kit has been very daunting, especially because we want to put it into um, a production environment. Building one off airplanes, and I've done many, many airplanes for people, where one off build, you make a part and you never do it again. Whereas the aim here is quite simply to put this airplane into a kit form and sell it as perhaps a turnkey and ready to fly airplane. But the difference between a one-off and doing things that are intended to be replicated are two vastly different things. So every single drawing, every single part we go through numerous times. For instance, the fuselage, we have done now nine times. Nine times we've redrawn the fuselage. Kept changing very small things, uh, accommodating others, because the head of a bolt needs clearance. To be able to put a bolt in needs clearance. And to design a one-off thing, so it's a little bit difficult to get the seat in, for instance, it's not a problem. But when you're selling a kit, it needs to be easy to put together. And then we've also designed it with maintenance in mind, so that once the airplane's put together, it becomes very easy to maintain. So all the bearings, all the nuts and bolts that are, are working hard are very easily accessible. We've got large uh, inspection panels under the wings. We've got some under the belly of the airplane. Simply remove a little panel from the inside and you get to all the push rod bearings. So we've done it in such a way that it's become very easy, A, to put together, takes very little time, and it's easy to maintain once you've done it. So the intention, obviously, is the kit. We will have different levels of kit, where you get a basic kit, which is all the parts that you require, but you'll need to do a lot more labor. And then we've got uh, the quick build kits. We've got the 51% rule kit for America, and we've got a complete airplane that is sprayed, ready to accept an engine, propeller, and instrumentation. Are you looking at South Africa principally in the beginning? and then going to look wider afield, like the United States? In the beginning, most certainly we're going to try and get as many aeroplanes flying as quickly as possible in South Africa. We will be able to help the person building it. We're even considering having a school or a, or a workshop where we'll teach them to do the covering because that seems to be one of the places where I, I've noticed through the years, people think that covering an aeroplane is this grey art, um, which it's not, it's, it's actually quite easy and when the guy gets into it, he realises to cover an aeroplane is, is quite simple. Right now, our market is in South Africa, but definitely we have eyes on the rest of the world. And Kevin, to date, I understand you've already taken four orders and this is still the prototype. It's been amazing. Uh, since the aeroplane's flown, uh, we've had numerous calls and strangely enough, most of them have been for ready-to-fly aeroplanes. We will offer very many different engine options. So we've got options right from a 100 horsepower Rotex up to the whole, which includes the entire series of Rotex right up to the 995s and probably the 996 when that is more, more readily available. Yes. And we can accommodate engines all the way up to an 0360, which is the Lycoming series. So we do have small uh, changes in the fuselage to accommodate the heavier in engine. Um, not for an all-up weight because we've designed the aeroplane around 800 to 850 kilograms as an all-up weight. The, the prototype was registered at 600 kilograms, which is allowing us to use the very small engine, the smallest that we would recommend is the 100 horsepower Rotex. It allows us to do our tests without an abundance of power, which, which sort of overshadow the aerodynamics of the aeroplane because you can power a brick if you've got enough power. The engine we've used here is a 912 ULS. It's not an IS. The IS has got quite a lot of electronics going on, so we chose the very simple two carburetor setup, which is the ULS 100 horsepower engine. Yes, it's come from a flying school, 
but we prefer that because it's a fairly young engine in, in years, but in hours it's getting along. But we don't have to run anything in, we know that it works, everything on the engine has been tested and proven to be working. And instead of putting a brand new engine in, we've opted specifically to use an engine that we know runs and runs very well. So without having to run an engine in and worry about cooling while we're worrying about a brand new airframe, we chose the option of a used engine. The propeller that we've used here is a new form propeller from Germany. As opposed to having the electronics governing the propeller, we've chosen just a simple hydraulic fuel, uh, uh, correction, hydraulic line so that we can in-flight adjust the pitch. So it's not a constant speed propeller by any means, but we can adjust its pitch in flight. That allows us to operate at either a very high RPM, very flat pitch setting, or a very coarse pitch setting, putting a lot of load on the motor that can heat up our coolants and heat up our uh, oils to a very high temperature by loading up the engine. So we've chosen to do it that way so that we can regulate. And it's proven in the hours that it's flown to work incredibly well, where the test pilot was able to get heat into the engine, get heat into the oil, and allow those temperatures to build up. The moment he unloaded it, the temperatures came way down very, very quickly. So it was very easy and it's a very simple way of operating the propeller. The 912 was chosen specifically because of its being a bulletproof engine. We've got many, many hours of experience on running 912s. We used to have a client that did two and a half thousand hours in a, a crop surveillance setup with 912s and we know them pretty well. So for us to put that into the airplane, especially being a prototype, we felt fairly comfortable that we'd get it to run optimally very easily. And how many test flights has the aircraft done so far? <laughs> to date, we've only got nine hours from the Nine hours, um, yes. But it's been, the initial test flight was well over an hour which proved to me that our cooling is working absolutely magnificently. The test pilot came back and said, don't change anything, which is the first I've ever heard. Every time we've made a comment on should we try this or should we try that, he said, please don't change anything. <laughs> so to be able to get a top speed at the present moment with a small engine of 105 miles an hour indicated is pretty good. We've also been able to do tests right down um, at the stall where we're getting on the second notch of flat, which is 30 degrees, we're getting an indicated stall speed of 20 miles an hour. Wow, that's fantastic. Uh, so that, of course, is going to fit very nicely into the LSA route. Very much so. LSA, specifically locally, hasn't got that many um, restrictions. They don't have as many restrictions. So in the States, of course, we wouldn't be able to use a constant speed or a variable pitch propeller at the present moment. But then we'll pitch a prop in between what we have as a climb prop and a cruise prop, and there's always a happy medium. But for the South African market, with our high density altitudes, high temperatures, this is the aeroplane to use. Even when it, we've had a few visits from the wildlife guys wanting to use it for um, anti-poaching, and they love the visibility out of it, they love the fact that we can fly so slowly, they love the idea that we can have both doors open, and including we can have half the fuselage on the sides, all the lower portions in a polycarbon, so you could look right through if you wanted to. Yes, that's absolutely amazing. I very much like the way you've done the door. Um, the top flaps right open to the, and clips onto the wing, and the bottom folds forward. That's absolutely amazing. The, the whole idea was to modernize the cab. So the, the shape of our window and the arc at the bottom was just to give it a modern flair, almost as if we've wrapped the front windscreen around the sides and up into the rear windscreen. During lockdown, it was rather difficult because we had just taken on Aiden and we must have spent 10,000 phone calls together and, and, and WhatsApp, video WhatsApp, and to try and explain over the phone, what I want to have changed never comes out quite the same way. If I am able to draw a little sketch, it becomes easier. But yes, we did. We, we perfected a whole lot of things. We finalized a lot of things. But it still left a lot of, of small items to, to do when we got back. But it gave us a lot of time without interruption, which has been very difficult. When 
here in a working environment, we're still trying to run uh, a maintenance shop at the same time, it becomes a little awkward. You can't actually focus 100% of your attention onto the, the design of the airplane. So it was actually a welcome relief that we were able to spend as much time on the design during that lockdown period as we did. Many of the things we actually came back and with a fresh mind were able to do again. That's why we've probably drawn the fuselage nine times and maybe it's a record, I don't know, but it's certainly a lot of times. And it's every time not changing major things, but we found it easier not to add to the fuselage by our drawings, but to redraw. And we've tried to keep it as simple as possible, as few closing panels as possible. So, for instance, the, the gap between the fuselage and the, uh, and the wing, I didn't want to have a, a cover strip. So we've designed it in such a way that the wing butts up against a butt group on fuselage and it leaves a three millimeter gap that we, we put some sealer on it. And it just makes the assembly so neat and clean and it allows us to put the fuel tanks in the wing with all the side glasses, with all the fuel pipes in it and only have to join between the fuselage and the actual joint the, uh, at the back and the front where we pick up the fuel. So it made it a lot cleaner and a lot quicker. Each wing, I presume, has its own spar, and those spars are then connected to the main, the, 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 let's call it the fuselage spar, at the top. Is that how it works on the Orion Cup? The Orion Cup, what we've done is we've had the front and rear spar excluded specifically for our own design, for our own work. That spar is a 6061 T6 um, aluminium, and we put it on the route and we've been putting in some lightning holes and draw all the ribs stations and the holes for the ribs to be connected. It is then connected to the fuselage with two bolts. So we put doublers at the end of each spar. In the kit it would come with the doublers already attached and you simply put a bolt through it, an A and bolt through that attaches it to the wing. And then on the outboard side we have a lift strip with a single attachment and that's got a rose joint and a single bolt through it. So very, very easy to put the wing on and very simple to tell you as well. You talked to me earlier that you were going to make some versions of the Orion Cup with a slightly longer fuselage to take a larger engine. How are you going to accomplish that in the kit? What we have done to accommodate many different engine options is we have what we call the RS kit, which is basically the light engines, anything up to 110 kilograms. So the fuselage is actually shortened by 300 millimeters. The tail surfaces remain the same, the wing remains the same, the cabin area remains the same. And what will have changed in the kit would be a, a cowling which accommodates the Rotax series engines or any lightweight engines like the UL tower engines, which are fairly lightweight and they're very similar in weight as a, a, to the Rotax series. So we've decided to have two various, two options, simply to accommodate for engines above the 110 kilograms or below 110 kilograms by simply having a different length fuselage. And the standard 912 IS, uh, this one here, what, what is the weight of that engine? Install weight is probably in the 90 kilograms by the time you put your prop, you've got fluids in it, you've got the engine mount and you've got radiators. So it's in the, in the 90 kilogram range. We are obviously using a short fuselage to accommodate that. But in the prototype, as we've got here, we haven't done it. We've actually gone and used a 912 in the long version. It does put our CG a little bit further back than would be normal, but we're allowing that to be used as our testing phase. So we can very easily accommodate an aft CG and that's what we've been practicing and, and carrying on with at the present moment where we're adding barrels of water until the test pilot comes back and says please don't add any more. We haven't reached that point and we've gone back to 22 inches. Our projection is only 19 inches. So even at a 22 inch rear uh, CG, the airplane is still very, very handleable and docile and still has a perfect score. But at this stage, you're really only flying with one test pilot and it's two-seater. So in actual fact, that CG will go aft if you put another person in the back. The CG will definitely go aft, but because we have a light engine, we have our CG quite far back 
for the test setup, which only, it allows us to add less bond, which is easier to, to, to do in the testing phase. So we are still flying with a very far off CG at the present moment. So the next phase is that we're going to add weight to the nose of the airplane and move the CG now forward again so that we can now put people in the back and, and still be within a very, uh, you know, the envelope is not confined, it's quite a large envelope and we're just experimenting forward and after the present moment. Our expected load carrying based on the empty weight of the airplane firstly is going to, it's going to carry more than its own weight. That's exciting. The airplane has been designed from the outset to be an 800 to 850 kilogram all up weight airplane. We, on the first prototype, decided to leave it as a light sport airplane in South Africa of 600 kilograms, simply because we found in the past it's easier to explain to our civil aviation that we've done all the testing and everything up to 850 kilograms. But when you tell them that it's 850 from the beginning, it's more difficult to go down in weight. So it's much easier to increase the weight. So all our tests, all our design criteria has been around an 850 kilogram airplane with 4.8 positive and 3.2 negative Gs. So from the outset, we designed the airplane to be able to do aerobatics. Sportman type aerobatics, nothing strenuous, too, too strenuous on the airplane. So with an empty weight of between 360 and 380 kilograms, depending on the choice of engine and propeller, we will be able to put two people in with fuel, and as the weight comes down, we have a, a huge margin when it comes to, we were talking about 4.8 G at 800 kilograms, that G loading just goes up as the weight comes down. Correct, yes. In the prototype, we've got a 50 liter per side fuel tank, and it's expandable to 144 liters. We've done it in such a way that we can use the same fuel tank in the light sport and just add a small tank to the outboard section which is connected directly into that tank, which expands the fuel. Obviously, if you're running a Rotex, you don't necessarily need to have as much as 140 liters, so don't carry the extra weight, bring the weight down, and 50 liters per side is more than adequate for that. The test flying, has obviously started off at Kruger's door, but we've expanded, we've flown out to the Altebersport Dam and back, not for any other reason but to check what the cooling is going to do in a prolonged high, to high RPM setting and we're very happy with the results at the moment, but there's a long way to go in terms of what we can achieve. So we are still a bit busy trying to even bring our temperatures down lower than we have. Uh, the reason for that is because when we put a turbocharged engine in, the temperatures are elevated. And if we can maintain and contain those temperatures now and bring our engine temperatures way down, we know we won't have a problem when we put the bigger engines in. Well, this is the prototype, but when do you expect to start with the real aeroplane in terms of the kits? In other words, start selling and making some money. We would very much like to, have, as I said earlier, we have managed to sell four kits. We are aiming to start those kits by the end of this month. So we're going to start cutting and preparing. We've got the jig, which we can put in. We can produce a fuselage in about two weeks. So with a very limited staff. So we would like to be able to ramp it up and hopefully we will have enough enthusiasm and encouragement and sales to ramp that up. We would like to be able to do two per month, which is possible, which gives us 24 airplanes for the year. Training on it, uh, anybody who's done a tailwheel rating? If the Teddy, which I've flown, has any, any bearing on what we've got here, I was told it's not a Teddy, it's a pussy plane. So I found it very simple and very easy to fly. The feedback that we're getting from the test pilot on this airplane is that it's really easy to fly. I've taxied it, done high speed taxis and found it very directionally stable. So I have no reason to believe that it's a difficult airplane at all to fly. And I love the shape of what you've done here. Is this, has this come from the Teddy? No, that hasn't come from the Teddy at all. What we've done is, because we have narrowed the cord of the wing, we've been able to shorten the cord of the wing, I can shorten the length of the wing, and to add what is known as effective span. We're using a vortex generating tip 
yes. which will act, actually increase our span by eight inches on each side. And the theory is that you get it for free, but there's never a free lunch. <laughs> but it really, apart from looking very nice, it, it, it also um, stops the washout at the end of the week. The whole idea with the design is exactly that, to make sure that the tip vortex is pulled into a tiny, tiny corner and obviously reduce the drag by doing that. Type by doing this, yes. That's the dream. That's what we all believe. It's possible. A little bit of hard work. I do believe it's quite possible to see a number of these. Our dream at this point in time that we're working towards is having two of these aircraft at Oshkosh in 2024. The instrument panel is a little unconventional in the fact that it's not a flat plane. We've optically tried to keep the instruments the same distance from your eyes, at whether you're looking to the left, center or the right hand side of the panel. We've just got analog instruments on this airplane. We have a tablet that's doing our navigation, but we're not using it at the present moment because we're not really going far enough to worry about that. But it's easy enough to put a digital display in. There's an adequate place for it. There's adequate place for the big screen, touch screens if you want to hand the center. And we can have um, standby instruments on the left or the right hand side. If you opt to use a tablet for your navigation, we will open this panel, pull it down, it'll be a cubby hole behind here, which gives us a bit more space. We very simply put the magneto switches and the key switches next to each other on the right hand side, because on the left hand side we have the throttle, which is just behind your left knee. We've got the fuel tap down by your left hand side, and we have th on the Rotax engine, of course, we've got a choke lever. We have kept the controls pretty conventional in the sense that we have a, con a control stick, control column. Side to side is obviously aileron and it's a closed loop system using cables that run up the lift struts to the bell crank at the back of correction at the tip of the wing and a push rod that goes to the aileron itself and a cable that goes back to the opposite side. Elevator is operated by push rods which run underneath the seat and through the back and there's no cables involved at all it's all bearings and push rods rudders are very simple cables operate the rudder which is conventional for most aircraft so pressing the left pedal will make the airplane uh, turn left or yaw to the left and pressing the right or yaw to the right flap lever is an overhead lever on my left hand side you simply pull it and it will click into space, into its notches. We've got three notches of flap set up, 15, 30 and 45 degrees. And to release them you simply pull the button and they are spring loaded to be new, uh, set back to zero. Yes, we've used a balance spring for two reasons. Obviously when you sit on the ground if you don't have the balance spring it tends, the weight of the flap will put the flaps on for you. And secondly, if the wind's blowing, it'll just push the flap down. So it's a fairly lightly loaded spring, but the, co the positioning of this allows you to fly the airplane and not really look inside. We've got the idea of a bush plane is to be looking outside all the time. And without taking your focus away from the outside, you can reach up and get to the handle it's really easily, well placed, without being in your way. Even when you have the flap on full, the lever isn't far enough back to get in your way or in your vision. What we did with the seats was to try again to be what I like to call the same but different. Uh, I want to be comfortably seated, I want to be able to move the seat up and down so we've made it possible to move the seat by simply removing a pin. Material of choice for the seat was carbon fiber, firstly for the strength of it and secondly because it's nice and light and I like to be comfortably seated, I like a fairly high back seat we've got a built-in headrest and the whole thing about the seat is that we can move it up and down very easily and we can remove it by simply removing three pins the rear seat has a single pin to be pulled out and you can take the seat out in a matter of a few seconds <music>